Are you ready? I want us to read from Daniel chapter 3. And I want us to begin reading in verse 13. Now, before we read there, let me give you a little bit of history. Nebuchadnezzar is king, and he has made a decree. In fact, you'll find this decree in verse 5. He had commanded, now you remember, he has gone into Israel and taken captive some of Israel's young men, mightiest men. He's taken them captive, and Nebuchadnezzar had published a decree that whenever you hear the sound of the instruments of music, that you are to fall down and worship the image which Nebuchadnezzar had erected. But there were three Hebrew children and another fellow by the name of Daniel that refused to bow. And the theme of what I'm wanting to tell you and what I want to share with you is simply this. I'm going to say it just like Oral Roberts said it. If you don't bow, you don't burn. The law of compromise is if you bow, you burn. I remember a number of years ago, Brother Copeland said something to me as we were driving down the road going to a meeting, and he had a habit of turning around and saying things to you, just a phrase or two, and then he'd hush and just give you thought for food, or food for thought. <laughs> And um, I remember one day he turned around and pointed his finger at me and said, Jerry, anything you compromise to get, you'll ultimately lose. That's all he said. Well, I didn't understand that fully. But as I began to understand the principles of faith and standing on God's Word, and once you receive a revelation from God and you make up your mind that you're going to live by it, if you compromise it, whatever you compromise to get, you'll ultimately lose. The devil loves to cause people to compromise. The devil would love to cause the body of Christ to get under enough pressure to where she backs off. The devil loves to get you in a situation to where when you're standing for your healing is to create enough symptoms to where you'll compromise and agree with the rest of of the Christian world, that healing has passed away. Compromise is probably the number one sin that the body of Christ is involved in. And the Apostle Paul said, if you awake to righteousness, you sin not. You awake to righteousness, you sin not. When you get a revelation of who you are in Christ and your right standing with God, then compromise is out of the question. Why compromise if God's on your side? Amen. Why compromise if you know how it's going to turn out? You see, people who know and have awakened to righteousness know how it's going to turn out. Somebody said, you know how it's going to turn out? I know how every situation in my life is going to turn out. I didn't say I know how God's going to do it. I didn't say I know the avenues that God will use. But I know what God is going to do. The Bible says he's going to deliver me from them all. Why wouldn't he? I'm his child. Why wouldn't he deliver me? I'm the righteousness of God. Why wouldn't he deliver me? I'm just as much a son of God as Jesus is. Why would he leave me in a jam and deliver Jesus out of one? Jesus said, Father, show him that you love him as much as you love me. And if I can see God delivering Jesus out of hard places, then I can expect him to deliver Jerry out of hard places. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And since I know I have right standing with God, there's no need to compromise. You know, if somebody came in here and said, uh, Brother Jerry, the Lord has dealt with me about giving you a million dollars, and at the end of the month, I'm going to send you one million dollars. Well, in the meantime, all hell could break loose in my finances. I mean, it could look like, dear God, everything's falling apart. I hadn't got a dime, and it looks like that there's absolutely no way to ever get a dime. But if this man that told me that is a man that shall not lie, is a man of truth, he's faithful that promised, then I know how this is going to turn out. Why compromise just because the heat's on? 
Amen. Why compromise because of the present circumstances? Why fold up and quit? And somebody would come by about that time and say, you know, you ought to just quit. It looks bad. And I'd say, no, I'm not going to quit because he is faithful who promised. At the end of this month, I'm going to have a million dollars. There's no need me quitting because I know how this thing's going to turn out. Amen. Well, let me tell you something. The Bible does say many are the afflictions of the righteous, but don't you dare stop reading there. The Bible goes on to say, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. That's how it's going to turn out. Hallelujah. If you don't compromise. In fact, you'll find in the Amplified Version of the Bible, most of the time, every time you see the word righteous, it's prefaced with the word uncompromisingly. We need to become the uncompromisingly righteous. Nebuchadnezzar had made a decree, and he told the inhabitants of the land, he said, if you don't bow down when you hear the instruments of music, then you will burn. And there's three Hebrew children that absolutely refuse to bow, refuse to compromise. And some folks are quitting on a hangnail. These guys were facing a fiery furnace. I want us to read it. You'll notice here that it says, in verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these wise men before the king. Are these men before the king? Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image which I have made well. If you do this, it'll be well with you, he said. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now I want you to notice this is a, prime, a, a, a perfect example of the way the devil challenges the child of God today. God has promised you you're standing on his word and the devil will challenge it. It's exactly what he did with Eve. Why, you won't surely die. That's what he's tried to do with everybody that's made a decision to stand on God's Word. Some of you get the idea sometimes that, that fellows like myself, Brother Copeland, Brother Hagin, men that are out before the public and preaching the Word of God and, and uh, perhaps our ministries have become established and known around the country because of our ministries, that we never have an opportunity to compromise, that we never have an opportunity to fold up and quit. Some of you that, did, that saw these people standing here think, well, bless God, Brother Jerry wouldn't do that. You don't know the times that thought has crossed my mind and I've had to cast it down. The devil don't play fair. And what he loves to do is create enough pressure to get you to back off. Now, I want to tell you something about him. He, he don't like for me to reveal this, so listen closely. He just soon, I don't bring this up. But I can't help it. I like to tell it. I've learned something about him. By nature, he is a compromiser. Now, he don't want you knowing that. But by nature, he is a compromiser. He has no choice. He has to back off. The same God that said, let there be light, and there was light, also proclaimed, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The same powerful word of God that created the universe has already been spoken over the devil. And God has told the devil, when they resist you, you will flee. Do you understand? In other words, God as much as said, light be, devil flee. <laughs> Amen? And so by, by nature, Satan has to compromise when pressure is applied. And the pressure that you apply to him, it is written. 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 
It is written. And you keep that word slammed up against him, and that creates pressure. And God has already told him, when you sense that pressure coming on you, devil, that is your cue to exit stage right. Flee. Amen? Somebody said, what if he don't? He don't have a choice. Sometimes I wish he wouldn't just see what God do to him. But he has to. Did you notice when God said, light be, light didn't argue and say, I don't want to be. Light had no choice. Did you notice when Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves and said, peace, be still, the wind and the waves said, in about an hour. Did you notice when Jesus said, go down there and you, uh, the first fish you catch, Peter, take money out of his mouth. Did you notice the fish didn't jump up about that time and say, I'm tired of supplying these guys with money. Why don't you talk to the birds? <laughs> they have no choice. Did you notice when God told the prophet to go down there to the brook Cherith and the ravens will feed thee? The raven didn't say, I did it last week. Talk to the sparrow. They have no choice. Did you notice when God anointed the mule to preach, the mule preached, he had no choice. Did you notice when God anointed a man to tell the moon and the sun to stand still, the moon and the sun had to stand still, it had no choice. And when God said, devil, when my people come against you with the word of the living God, the same word that raised Jesus from the dead, the same word that created a universe, when they stand in your face and create pressure in your midst by saying my word, I want you to know, devil, that is your cue to flee. You will not argue, you will flee. Amen. Now see, when we get a hold of that, standing's not nearly as hard as you thought it was. Somebody said, I'm tired of standing. How long you have to stand, Brother Jerry, till you win? How long does it take to win till you don't have to stand no more? Amen. Amen. See, a lot of times we don't realize that when we're standing on God's Word, the same pressure that you're experiencing, the Lord showed me this the other day, and I'm telling you, I like to come undone when I saw it. You remember the Bible said that God turned the captivity of Job? It didn't say set him free. It said it turned the captivity. And that phrase kept sticking out to me, and I started doing some researching and going through every translation I could find and, and, and my Strong's Concordance and went through everything I could find about that phrase. God turned the captivity of Job. That's one thing to set a guy free, but it's something else to turn the captivity. And I began to study it, and what I found out, I tell y'all, it tore my office up. What it literally means, when you turn the captivity, that's, and we'd probably use this modern-day vernacular, we turn the tables, turn the tide. In other words, what happens is, it's one thing to get a guy free from some pressure situation, but it's something else to not only get him free, but put the pressure on the enemy that the guy that is now free once had. Turn the captivity. In other words, that's what God did. He delivered Job and put the pressure that was on Job on the devil. When you have your captivity turned, how many of you have ever been under pressure? It's not fun, is it? It's not fun laying in bed in your mind beginning to think thoughts of failure and the devil straddled you and every time you open your eye, he's telling you, you're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose. And you try your best to go to sleep, throw that pillow over your head and get up and walk around and go turn the TV on and do all those things you do when you get under pressure. It's not comfortable. There's times I've had to get up and go get in the car and drive down the road and turn my New Testament on because my head was trying to run away with me. Times I got up in the middle of the night and go walk out in the yard and just scream at the devil. Pressure is not fun. It's not comfortable. I don't like it. 
But then I found out, praise God, that when I have done all to stand, stand, and I found out that God is on my side, and God promised by His holy word that He would not allow the devil to put anything on me that I was not able to bear, and with the temptation, God would provide a way of escape, then I want you to know the pressure wasn't near what I thought it was, and God started turning the captivity, and this thing got a little bit different in its, in its outlook. Instead of me being the one under pressure, I just kept tightening up on the devil the Word. I just kept screwing that Word down on him, praise God, just like a vice around his head and just kept confessing the Word and confessing the Word until he just couldn't take it anymore. He had to get out of that vice and flee. Amen. Put the pressure on him. That'd be just like if somebody tied you up and bound you and then the captivity was turned. That means you get free and they get roped. That's the way I like the devil, roped, paralyzed, at his wit's end. Don't know what to do next. You ever heard this? I don't know anything else to do. I love to hear the devil saying that about me. I don't know nothing else to do with him. Only problem is he ain't got anybody to turn to. I do. God don't hear the devil's cry. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's three Hebrew children made up their mind they wasn't going to bow. Now, I've been talking about in these services that I've been ministering about knowing God, knowing God, not just heard of Him, but knowing God. The reason these three Hebrew children wouldn't bow is because they knew their God. They knew how God operates. They knew His delivering power. They knew God. And I want you to notice how they responded when the king said, I'm going to give you one more chance, boys. In other words, he's saying, now I'll tell you what, I have set up this image and the decree is you must fall down and worship when you hear the sounds of music and if you will worship, then it'll be well with thee. If you don't, you're going to burn. And then he added this as, you know, as an insult, and who is the God that is going to deliver you? I'd like to know his name. In fact, he even made a comment about this in, these, in Daniel. He said, I've been to your country. I couldn't see your God. He has no physical form like a man. Who is your God? Where is your God? You see, Nebuchadnezzar was one of the proudest men that ever lived. He thought of himself as a God. He had built a city that was second to none. He had built a fortress that was magnificent. He had walls.